Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We are a part of the We Are Libertarians Network. So if you're discovering us for the first time, then please go and check out some of our other podcasts. Uh, on My guest today is a co-worker at the Bob and Tom Show, uh, Josh Arnold. Josh, you are uh, one of the cast members of the Bob and Tom Show. Yes. And, and a very welcome addition to the show. Oh, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, and uh, he's also a stand-up comedian. Uh, I've heard you're funny. I've never seen your you <laughs> live. Oh, yeah, you haven't seen my act. No, yeah. Yeah. no. Uh, I, I And you've been on the podcast before. You tried to teach me. You taught me a lot about comedy writing, actually, when you were on the podcast. Yeah, that was a cool, uh, cool chat. Yeah. Um, I can never claim to be a... Um, you know, guru of comedy writing, but I certainly uh, did. Anything ever come from that? I did never, ever... I I never really decided to do stand up comedy because I just don't. It's just not necessarily something I think I want to do. But I basically do comedy writing every day here yes. at work at uh, the Bob and Tom Show, and uh, I've applied it into other areas, into my podcast, into my work, into. Other projects, so it, 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 keeping keeping ideas and and making sure that you know you follow through with some of that stuff. So yeah, it did it did help. Um, it's just not something uh, going and doing open mics. I don't think that's something necessarily that that I want to do at this point. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't blame you. It's a um, it's it's a tough unless you're you know committed. It's almost like why would I put myself through this potential abuse? <laughs> right. Um. Uh, even though you know it can be a lot of fun, also, but yeah, yeah, it's. I'm also the type that the second I sit down and do something on purpose, like writing a a set, I will never be able to do it. Gotcha. It's like if you say, "Hey, we need to name this thing," I'm like, "I'm just having a block here." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so when uh, so we're talking today about your movie, The Impersonators, which is an indie film that you've done, and you actually you were the writer or the co-writer? Co-writer. Okay. With uh, Joshua Hall, who was the director, okay. and uh, I also star in it. Yeah, and uh, I've seen it. It is absolutely hilarious, and the jokes in it. Now it's low, low budget. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But the writing in it is fantastic, and and the acting is really good, and the the execution of the jokes are very funny. Uh, so when you sit down to write a movie, I mean, how do you write a movie? Like, how do you get past that creative block that I think most people feel that resistance? And actually follow through and come up with a script and find an end product out of that. Well, in this instance, the idea came from a news article that Joshua Hall had read, and he sent it to me. And he said, "Hey, I kind of want to work on this um, this idea of these, uh, f you know, these sort of uh, vigilante superhero type type things." And what, what the the article I guess dealt with a guy in Mexico who would dress up like Batman every now and again, and the police were <laughs> okay. like, "Hey, we want to help." We want you to, like, we want to use you to try to scare away crime. Right. And um, so, yeah, so so he already had the idea, and he had about 60 pages written, and he sent it to me. So this was a little different than how I would normally write a movie um, because I was doing rewriting and then just finishing it, essentially. Right. And so um, the part that you're talking about, the block, the, like, where do I begin, mm -hmm. was already done for me. Right. Um, he had created... Um, a lot of the characters already and some of the situations, and so I just took those and ran. Right. Um, but when I'm starting new, I usually just have a character in mind mm -hmm. because uh, – or maybe a situation, but usually a character in mind because the story – the best stories develop from a good character. Right. So you, if, if you have a good character, you, you know, you can put that person in almost any situation and it'll be interesting. How do you, how do you think of situations to put – characters into i mean do you sit and you just think ah this thing happened to me at the grocery store wouldn't it be funny if this character had this happen x y and z that kind of thing or uh you know let's say i'm at the grocery store and something weird happens um i'm like oh man that's so in my mind i'm recollecting how i handled the situation right and it's like man what if somebody had anger management issues and they were in that situation or what if somebody was um like a spy and they had to deal with being you know, their neighbor being nosy at a grocery store or something like, and then it's, so then it kind of comes from that. Right. Um, when I'm writing a script, uh, when I've already got the character and I've got an idea of the story, um, usually the, uh, 
circumstance. Well, here's the, my biggest advice to anybody who wants to write a script mm-hmm. would be to read Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat. It's the greatest script writing book I've ever read. Hmm. And it really helps you map out your characters, your plot, your story, and in a way that the movie could be successful. Right. Um, it's, you know, some people might read and go, oh, this is just for commercial crap. No, this is, if you want to be a successful screenwriter, this is probably the model you should follow. Yeah, and, and a lot of times the war between commercial and art, it's, it's I th- in my opinion, it's getting closer and closer. Yeah. You know, because the age of the internet has allowed people to do what they want to do, but at the same time, you know, you, you can find an audience for that niche yep. that you have. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, companies, distribution companies now, it's like, why would I make a deal with you when I can go sell this on my own and probably do better? Right. So they're going to, so yeah, so art and um, commerce are definitely going to, you know, have become closer, as you mm-hmm. said. Right. So how many movies have you written? Um, Around four. Okay. And yeah, I, I mean, I finished four. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm always working on, like right now I'm working on a couple different projects. What has been the end result of those four movies? Um, Nothing, really. Okay. I mean, the one has been, the impersonators that I co-wrote uh, has been made mm-hmm. and is now available. Um, the other, you know, a cup, the rest just sort of sit there. One is in the, in very early stages of pre-production. Right. Um, we fully intend to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, whether or not that'll happen, or, or I should say when that happens it remains to be seen. Um, and then the others are just kind of there. And quite frankly, they probably should never be produced. They were scripts I wrote and finished and weren't that great. Right. So, and I could go back and rewrite them, have, you know, now that I've learned more since then, fix them, make them a little better. Right. But I'd rather focus on new things. So writing a script is one thing because it's you at your computer or pen and paper if you're old school. Uh, you're at your computer and you write it, but it's another thing to go into uh, pre-production, start putting together how things are going to be made, start scouting for, I mean, I think what is the? how do you decide, all right, we're going to make this. Because some of your projects you've said, eh, this wasn't that good, well, I'm not going to pursue it, versus this, where you go, all right, we're going to do this thing. How, how do, what is the criteria that you might use to green light a project like that? Uh, for me, it would be, um, if I don't make this, I'm going to go insane. It's sort of it's sort of like that. It's like, I have to get this out there. I have right. to. And not, not, you know, I don't want to say it's like, oh, I have to get this out there so people... People need to see this. It's <laughs> right, not that. Right. It's more of just, this is going to stick in my head forever mm-hmm. until I get this out there in some form or another. Right. So that's my my biggest factor. Also, um, you know, you need to think money. It's like, all right, so this script has four people and two locations. Is that going to be cheaper than the one that has 12 people in 17 locations? Of course it is. Right. So it's like, what do we have at our disposal right now? Do, can I find four Good actors and, and a couple locations, yes. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's just a matter of economics. So with the impersonators, and it is essentially a group of I- I- imposters. <laughs> yeah, their birthday party, right. uh, they dress up for birthday parties as superheroes, right. and they're not very good at it. Right. And then? And then they uh, are hired by a small town nearby to just boost morale. They're supposed, right. This town has had some hardships. They're just supposed to kind of... Cheer people up with their costumes and their, you know, silly activities. And when they get there, they're accidentally mistaken by this group of dim-witted criminals as actual superheroes <laughs> trying to impede their criminal enterprise. Right. And so they kidnap a couple of them, and the rest of the impersonators actually have to go, well, we might actually need to be heroes in this situation. And they step up and and do their best to be heroes. So you have you have a lot of cast. How do you find actors to perform in your movie. Most of the actors in this situation were uh, friends of Josh Hall, mm-hmm. the director. He had already made a movie with a lot of the folks who were in The Impersonators and knew he wanted to work with them again. He was, And he was friends with uh, a lot of them. and um, So they were already cast before the script was written, which is traditionally the opposite <laughs> of what you... Right. Now, the, the, the good thing you can do with that is you can write 
to people's strengths. Mm -hmm. The negatives of that are you. There was some like personal politics when I when I got a hold of the script. I killed off a lot of the characters because right. it was there were way too many and mm -hmm. and. <laughs> You know, then the feedback I got was, "Hey, I already promised that person a pretty big role. You can't kill them off." It's like, uh, okay. Right. I, I mean, we'll make that work, but that's usually not the way to go. Yeah, yeah. So th then you you get your actors, and like, do people get paid on an independent movie? I mean, how does sometimes not in this case? Okay. So there was, um, uh, yeah, no. Th th some of the crew got paid, and. That's it. But we put everybody up and we fed everybody. That was essentially <laughs> right. That's good. Yeah, yeah. We were able to do that. And so you had how many locations that you shot at? Oh man, I we have it somewhere. I have it written down somewhere, but it's dozens. Hmm. And the cast is like, I think speaking roles is around forty or fifty. Wow. And so this is all. This was all way too much for a very small independent <laughs> film. Quite honestly. Right. But, um, you know. Everybody banded together. Everybody, had, there were long days, fourteen-hour days for twelve days straight, mm -hmm. and sometimes longer days. And um, everybody came together, and for the most part, I think had a pretty good time doing it. And there's some really funny stuff, uh, you know, that I think we captured. And that's one of the things too about writing the script is once you get on set, that script is um, not as etched in stone as you think it will be when you're writing it. Right. It and which is good. It needs to everything that you capture on camera should be at least feel organic. And so you should have some wiggle room within that script. And we definitely played around with dialogue. There was a lot of improv improvisation mm -hmm. on set. And even like you know some economic things like hey man, we cannot get a location for this scene, can we rewrite it to fit a location we can get? Hmm. And there was a lot of on-the-fly stuff like that, too. How do you get a location? In this case, it was just not cold calling. Hmm. It was, hey, we, we need to shoot in a school. Can we shoot in your school? <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of people telling us no. Interesting. And then, yeah, and then finally we would find, you know, somebody would say, sure, yeah, come on in. Okay. And, and so you shot this all in 12 days? Yeah. Okay. It, Everybody just takes off work and like how does <laughs> how do you get how do you get forty people to take that much time off? And that was and also one of the hardest parts about this. Was, yeah, uh, and we had a unit production manager who uh, was brilliant because she had to deal with um, everybody's work schedules. A lot of people did not take off work, hmm. so when you have scenes with like we do, where they're ensemble scenes with six, eight people. It's like, what day out of these 12 days can we get everyone together to film yeah. this? And there were, again, there was some of that editing on the fly where, hey, so-and-so has to work today. Well, you get their lines now. <laughs> and That's we'll just serious. explain that they're not that, like, that kind of thing. So, That's funny. Yeah. So you, you film it, and like, what kind of cameras did you film this movie with? This movie was actually shot on a RED, which is what... Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, explain what that is. For well, uh, I guess maybe the best explanation is it's what Peter Jackson used on The Hobbit, I believe. Right. And, I mean, it's a pretty... Yeah, it's, it's, it's top of the line for it, sure. It looks beautiful, and you know, you've got lighting, you've got sound, and what are some other aspects of filmmaking the, the crew what kind of crew do you have to hire well we had uh, a professional crew they were mostly from um we filmed this in uh the indianapolis area and mm -hmm. so they were mostly from um oh uh, well what's the school that's sort of a media school near uh heron uh, no it wasn't the, it was um up near fort wayne or towards going towards fort wayne i don't know <laughs> okay <laughs> muncie yeah muncie. yeah muncie. yeah okay. yeah, yeah. Um, what's ball, the school? Ball, ball State. State. Yes, yes, thank you. A lot of them were Ball State grads. Okay. And uh, who had gone through uh, production courses and everything. And That's where David Letterman went to school. Yes. And, and he has uh, gifted the university with one of the top-of-the-line media. I mean, you want to go to media, you go to Ball State. Right. Okay, you know, yeah. Butler has a great school here locally, um, but uh, University of Indianapolis, but Ball State, man, their media department is great. Yeah, and we had quite a few. I mean, a handful of them came from uh, Ball yeah. State. And so... Um, I'd say we had a crew of about eight, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. And, yeah, they would uh, – and everybody, you know, um, we had – you know, some guys whose primarily focus, primary focus was the lighting. Mm -hmm. We had a, a director of photography. We had 
uh, sound audio, and so but but everybody ch- kind of chipped in when needed, mm-hmm. which was nice. Yeah. You have to on these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and like costumes, you guys had elaborate costumes. Do you, I, I assume you weren't sewing them at, at no, night? No, we've uh, Josh Hall found them online from like some Asian country and Hilarious. said, "Oh my gosh, these are like knockoff." Superman, Wonder Woman costumes. We can just use these. That is so funny. And so that's what we ended up using. Yeah. Okay, so you you shoot all of this footage, and you've... Pr- how many hours of footage do you think you shot? Mm. Uh, you know, th- I don't know. But it, it's not as much as you would imagine because we were so pressed for time that we didn't have the luxury of getting 12 takes or 15 yeah. takes. A lot of them were three to five takes. And so we, and, and again, the unit production manager was amazing because she would sit there with a notebook for every take. And then let's say there were five takes. She would write on next to take one bad, take Mm -hmm. two. Okay. Take three. Perfect. And then the editor could just take, just go, Oh, well, we're going to use the perfect one and not have to sift through the rest of the footage. Yeah. Because editing video, I mean, that's, that's, as hard as shooting because you've got to make all these different choices and when you've got that much footage can you take us through the editing process when you've got all this footage you kind of you have the script i assume yeah and that's your guide right but how many choices are made in the editing process where you eliminate add and what does the script look like versus the finished product um in this case we Man, we probably got 70% of the script, hmm. and then the remaining 30% was either ad-libbed or just some changes made, uh, again, because of location issues or weather issues or scheduling issues. And so uh, we got pretty close, but the finished movie is probably, I mean, in some there are some scenes that are better than they were in the script, and then there are some that are worse, mm-hmm. but for the most part, it all, you know, it all came out in the wash, so... Yeah. Um, the editing process was probably was one of my favorite processes, but but it's so tedious. Yeah, and it takes a long time because, like you said, and here the editor uh, Randy Atkins, who's in L, she's an editor in L.A. I sat with her for weeks, and she let me sit next to her because she's uh, very funny, but. But I had specific comedic timing in mind and mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, Josh does this at work. He sits over my shoulder and nitpicks. You're not, the- I mean, for the, <laughs> yeah, for lack of a better term, that's exactly. But it's great because you don't want one opinion. I mean, an, your editor has to be a funny person. Absolutely. If you're making if, yes. any kind of comedy video of yes. any sort. But at the same time, I'm not a professional comedian. I'm not a professional. I don't, I don't have the uh, comedic writing experience that you have. So when I'm editing a video, for instance, I want you sitting there going, I want this, I want this. I, I You know, you're almost, as our friend PJ, who's been a guest on the podcast in the past, has said, you want to move the furniture while the other person is, you know, steering the ship. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so it's good in that respect because you want somebody sitting over your shoulder going, here's the choice we're going to make. Can you do this? Yeah. My yeah. problem is I need to see all, like, if I've got three options, I need to see all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so that can drive an editor crazy going... We just cut the way you asked. Now you want me to cut it back to what it was, right? Like that, but it, it's important. I mean, it's uh, editing is unbelievable. It's I, I had no idea. I had a small idea. I had no idea though how big the um, uh, an effect editing has on <laughs> the finished product. Hmm. It can ruin a joke. It can create a joke that wasn't there. Yeah, and oh, it's it's just awesome. Yeah, and it's nice that you have a pleasing personality because if you've got somebody standing over your shoulder berating you, yeah, that's got to be tough. <laughs> I, can't, I mean, that's got to suck. And uh, I, normally, I would have never, you know, you really you would want, the last thing you would want in an editing room is a writer or actor <laughs> in there because you'd be it'd be like, oh, this is just going to be a vanity project. Right, this person's just going to try to get the best shot of them, and that yeah. and that was not. I really looked at this as what will be the funniest thing. For every, you know, mm-hmm. what what will be the funniest results? And um, Josh Hall had expressed to me before that he hates editing and he never liked it. So I didn't feel you know out of uh, place, or I didn't feel like I was uh, out of bounds, you know, helping assisting with the editing there. So 
So now you're in the process of making you're you're marketing the movie, and uh, hence why you're on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, and and you've done Chick McGee's podcast. You've done Jeff Bibbert's podcast. Uh, you're we have an active Facebook page going. Your Facebook is active. You've got f- cast members and everybody sharing it. What are how do you get the movie marketed, printed, and into people's hands? So the way we're going, we're going a self-distribution route. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a couple very small distribution companies that expressed some interest. Mm-hmm. The uh, deals were not good at all. We There was a chance that we never would have seen any, a, a penny ever. Interesting. Um, and so, and then, uh, uh, you know, truth be told, a fair amount of distribution companies weren't interested they were like there's no you don't have one name in here you don't have um uh, josh arnold is in this movie <laughs> how could you well even now they would go who right. but like this was even before i was on the sh- on bomb and tom <laughs> right um and so uh the you know there's not enough violence for it to be marketed as a you know for the gore hounds mm-hmm. there's not enough sex to be marketed towards the perverts right yeah <laughs> there's there's elements of both, right? But you know, it's it's so it was kind of a tough sell for a distributor to take a risk on, and the ones that were willing to take a risk, it wasn't a risk because they weren't going to give us anything. So <laughs> right, so we went. You know what? This should be self distributed. There's no reason we shouldn't just do this on our own, um, except for the fact that we completely out of money when it comes to this project. So mm. what we have done, and what a lot of people do now, is have done uh, pre-orders. Now, what most people will do now is they'll, uh, you know, everybody's familiar with Kickstarter campaigns or Indiegogo or or GoFundMe or whatever. So what people will do is say, hey, if you give to uh, our production, you'll get a copy of the movie when it's done. Mm-hmm. Well, that worked for, you know, that worked for a while. But now people will go ahead and make a movie on their own and then say, hey, you can... Give us – you can buy the – the movie's finished. Right. So why don't you go ahead and contribute to this finished product? You can see the trailer. You can read about it. You can see some early reviews and decide if you want to own it as opposed to sort of a crapshoot. Is the thing going to be good or not? Right. Well, now you can judge for yourself. Yeah, I think that's going to be good. I'll go ahead and – and then with that money, uh, they get the uh, Blu-rays made. Or, you know, collectors these days – Want, um, first off, buying movies is, you know, the physical movie, a dying industry, mm-hmm. as we know. I mean, right. CDs, the Blu-rays, DVDs are right. all. But there are there's a certain group of folks out there who want to collect, you know, they, want, they like being a collector. Right. So a lot of films will do, uh, independent films will do some VHS, <laughs> especially like, Let's say you make a grindhouse type movie. It's right. cool to get like a VHS copy of it because it makes it feel even that more, yeah, uh, much more authentic. Um, things like that. So, so this is what we've done. We are uh, selling pre-orders that will be shipped. They'll ship mid March, and the uh, money will all pay for the production of the Blu-rays. Do you have to hit a certain number? Yeah, yeah, we do. And uh, we're almost there. We've got two days left in the pre-sale. The benefit, then, to people who purchase during this pre-order is that they're going to get the movie cheaper than anybody else will. Right. They'll get it sooner, they'll get it cheaper, and um, they uh, will get free shipping on it as well. And oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah. So they'll get about, if you order the Blu-ray now, you'll get about $10 off what it'll normally be. You've also got a T-shirt combo deal? Yeah, which I think, I mean, and... Yes, it's an upsell, but I do think it's the way to go. Mm-hmm. You get a Blu-ray and a great T-shirt of the movie for forty bucks. The art, and the artwork's really cool. It's unbelievable. Yeah. My buddy Russ uh, Russell Mark Olson, who's a terrific comic artist, um, he and I lived in Korea for a couple of years. We knew each other. We did improv for years. We went to the same university, and then uh, he now lives in England with his wife. But uh, he did this. I mean, it it it's just gorgeous. Yeah. It's pretty. The, the the Blu-ray and the DVD, it all works together. It looks pretty. Yeah, the packaging's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so then it, it's it's not just the pre-order. Afterwards, you keep selling the DVDs. You get how many printed, and you keep selling them. And 
We, yeah. on, uh, quite honestly, our goal is to make our mo- everybody's money back. Right. And if we make a cent profit, that's a grand slam in our eyes. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, we're just – so we're doing an initial printing of um, uh, 750 to 1,000, depending on how the pre-sale goes. Mm-hmm. And that might be it. Yeah. So there are – there's a good chance that only 1,000 people out there will have a chance to own this thing. And then, I mean, that's a true collector's sort of thing. And actually, that's one of the things we're doing. We're hand-numbering – each uh, Blu-ray case. Cool. They can be autographed if you guys like, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, you know try to make it as special an item for you as possible. So, w- what about digital? I mean, things like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and all that kind of stuff. A lot of people will go, ah, "I'm not going to get the DVD. I'll just wait for it to come out on Netflix." Yes. Is that even? That's probably not even a thing here, is it for you? Guys? Uh, Netflix probably not, but certainly uh, Vimeo, mm-hmm. um, a- Amazon. Those are all, uh, you know, definite possibilities, and I can't imagine that eventually they won't be on there. You know, I think right. at some point you'll, it'll be available for download or stream. But for right now, we're just kind of going old school with it. And um, I so if if it is available for downloading and for streaming, that's a, a ways away. So how do you buy it? How do I get my copy of the impersonators? We actually instead of building a uh, whole again we didn't have any money so mm. instead of building a, a whole website for the movie itself we just tacked it on to my website which is that josharnold.com mm-hmm. and i have a store page and on that store page you can order it you can watch a trailer you can watch a clip and uh yeah you can it, it it's um it's available a lot of these clips and a lot of special promos and things are available on all my social media which is all at that josh arnold he also has a T-shirt, and don't spoil it because I want people to go and see this. He has a T-shirt that I that you gave me one, and I've worn it out, and everybody always just they laugh at the T-shirt, they love it, they think it's hilarious, and you've got the little stand-up clip that explains the T-shirt. Oh yeah! So go and check out Josh's store so you can uh, get the behind the scenes on that T-shirt. It's <laughs> it's hilarious. It describes you, it describes me, and it describes, frankly, most of my audience. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's very funny. Uh, okay, so listen, help Josh out. I- I'm not doing this podcast to help Josh, okay? I'm doing it because I really liked the movie. I really thought it was very funny. I'm so glad, man. I appreciate yeah, that. There, there is a scene in there that is one of the funniest scenes in any movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah, okay? I'm so glad you think so. Maybe I am just, uh, listen, my normie filter is broken. My idea of what is socially appropriate is not... <laughs> in line like it used to be but i laughed so hard at this scene it's it's worth the money just to see this one scene that it's, scene when we we had some screenings of the movie yeah and, and at a movie theater and they uh you know a lot of people came <laughs> the reactions to that scene in particular were all over the place yeah How, people howling with laughter others Horrible. Groaning, <laughs> yeah, yeah, horribly <laughs> disgusted. <laughs> it, you'll know exactly which one I'm talking about if you when you when you see the movie and you see the scene. Please tweet both uh, that Josh Arnold on Twitter, yes, and at Chris Spangle. Let him know that you saw the <laughs> the movie, you saw that scene, and tell us what you thought of it. Uh, so please go to thatjosharnold.com. Go to the store, get the movie. It 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 you're not going to be disappointed, okay? It is a low budget independent movie. Yeah, yeah, we're not trying to fool anybody. This right. wasn't, uh, you know, this isn't a big Hollywood production. There's some right. certainly some technical flaws and, right. you know, think. But uh, I think it's, it, it, I think it, there are really a lot of jokes in there that people it, are going to like. It is my kind of humor. It is the kind of humor of anybody that likes the We Are Libertarians Network. It's the kind of humor that anybody who likes Bob and Tom will like this movie. It's just it, it it's a charming movie and well acted and funny so uh it's also unrated this is not a family friendly (laughs) film (laughs) right so please go check it out on my recommendation uh don't do it for josh do it for me okay uh so that josh arnold get the movie thanks for joining me thank you chris i really appreciate it yeah and if you ever have any questions about movie making please hit josh on your on your twitter what's your twitter yeah uh at that josh arnold all right and please share this video if you uh if you like josh 
If you like me. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Look at this handsome face. <laughs> we're two very handsome men. Uh, please, we're, we're putting this video up on the We Are Libertarians Facebook page, the YouTube, my personal page. Please share this. Help spread awareness of Josh's movie. Help spread awareness of the We Are Libertarians Network. Uh, please share this podcast if you're listening on audio with your friends and family. That is how we grow. That is how we help independent media producers grow. That is the future of entertainment. It is doing it on your own. So, yeah. So uh, very exciting and uh, very happy for you. It's a great product, and uh, I'm I'm uh, really excited to recommend it to my audience. Thank you so much, Chris. Absolutely. Um, what's a libertarian? Uh, it is someone who believes in smoking a lot of pot <laughs> and as much sex as possible, uh, no rules, eating the hearts of your enemies. Well, then these folks would love the impersonators. <laughs> absolutely. There's, yes, absolutely. All right, thank you for joining us here on The Chris Spangle Show. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate you sharing uh, everything at We Are Libertarians. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Chris Spangle with Josh Arnold. Have a good day.